Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, thank you once again to Zeifmans for hosting and providing space as well as providing lunch. Um, I will note at the outset, although it's less relevant with this topic than it was with the previous topic, that nothing I say should be taken as halak advice and guidance and practical statements of what to do. You should speak to your rabbi. So if any of you are in a position to offer tax incentives to somebody, make sure that you you do that, um, that you consult first. Um, If you have a cell phone and can put it on mute or vibrate, that would be very helpful. Um, I'm going to give out the sign-in sheets. I'll start them over here, and they'll go around. Um, Even if you signed in last week, please make sure that you sign in. This way we can send you an accurate letter of attendance for those who want credit. In the event that you receive the email promoting this, you do not need to put down your email address. It means I already have it, Um, but we do need uh, your your name. And if you want to join the weekly email with which we advertise other programs, you can check the third column uh, towards that. I'm going to give out the sheets. Thank you. All right. And yes, next week's topic will be by Ezra Diena, and the topic is business lunches in the eyes of the CRA and halacha. So that will be uh, next week at 12.30. Our topic, tax incentives for Amazon HQ2, and I'm going to insert the question mark here. Steve didn't really have a question mark in the way that he worded it. Um, Sound economics, question mark. Sound Judaism, question mark. Is it really, um, is this a good strategy financially, and is it an approved strategy religiously? So first of all, for the purpose of our discussion, um, I'm going to define tax incentives as government programs which offer tax abatements, um, earmarking of how taxes are going to be spent, uh, forms of government investment, public-private partnership, which make a particular location attractive for business investment. So the government uses relief from taxes or earmarking of tax dollars and how they're going to be spent. It tries to incentivize a particular location for a business and it came up in the case of Amazon HQ2 very very famously where they declared that they were going to start a second headquarters and all sorts of places all around North America including Toronto competed for the opportunity to host their uh, their new site of course we know what what happened in the end they decided on New York and Virginia with a little bit in Nashville and then after they made the announcement there were such protests from politicians in New York that they decided you know what we don't need you and uh, and they said we're going to do it differently there isn't going to be an HQ2 um, and a lot of the protests centered on the issue of this issue of tax incentives in which they said that we are going to relieve the corporation from all sorts of tax responsibilities because we want the jobs that they're going to bring to the area. It will be to everybody's benefit. And, uh, and that was something that some of the legislators and their followers protested. So opening this, I'd like to ask a question. Why would a government offer tax incentives like this, an abatement in particular, where they're giving up money that would otherwise have come to them? What's the reason for them to, to make this kind of an offer? Time. Right. So one rationale for it is what you lose in tax dollars, you will make up later on through all of the other ways in which they will feed into the government and that they will feed into the economy. It isn't just about they'll pay us more later on, but they're also going to provide supporting businesses with with money so that you open up a headquarters that is going to give all sorts of business to everything from food vendors to professionals who are going to be needed to serve that population. So that's one piece of it. Other reasons why. Yeah. Employment. Employment. Good. Right. There is the hope that they're going to promote jobs in the area. That's absolutely true. It's true that it's a hope. It's not as I do that it's going to happen. The um, what else? 
Good way to get reelected. We brought in jobs. We brought in business. It's no joke. I read a lot of papers on this, on how tax incentives work and what's you know and and um, what the positives are supposed to be. And one of the big cautions is don't let politicians be the ones to drive this because they're less concerned about the financial repercussions and whether everything works out, and more concerned with being able to tell the world we brought Amazon to our city. So um, so that's a major concern is that the politicians are doing it for that reason. What else, though, is among the positives? We'll get to the negatives. Okay. So it yeah. doesn't cost money. Sorry? It doesn't cost anything. Because? Because you're not getting it if they don't cost. Exactly. One of the big arguments is, if we don't offer this, they're not going to move here, and we get zero dollars. So this way, we get the business, and we also get zero dollars. But it could, again, translate into jobs, other types of income uh, down the road. There was a hand over there. Cheryl, was it you? Raising real estate values potentially. It's actually one of the major uses of tax incentive zones is to promote uh, distressed areas, areas that don't have to try to help build them up. Uh, another one is that anchor businesses can promote industry clusters. The idea is, you, you, you know, you, the, the big vision is, let's create the next Silicon Valley, right? You bring in a couple of tech companies, and then all these other tech companies are going to spring up in the area. So these, these are all um, reasons that are given. I brought you in source number one on the sheet. I'm not going to read it out. It's just there if it's of interest. Um, Ernie Eves when he was Premier of Ontario, back in 2003, declared the Northern Ontario Tax Incentive Zone. And this is from his office's press release supporting that, uh, that idea. If you look in the third paragraph of it, the um, eligible businesses located in Northern Ontario would not be required to pay provincial business education tax, capital tax, or employer health tax. Municipalities will be asked to provide full municipal property tax relief for all eligible businesses for 10 years which is one of the big complaints which we're going to get to is that often the tax incentives outlive the business. They'll move there. They'll be there for seven, eight years. By the time 10 years rolls around, they're done. Or better, they've moved elsewhere. <laughs> and at that point, you never actually get any of the tax benefit. Interestingly, during the race for Amazon HQ2, um, Toronto, which did have a whole big uh, package that they offered, did not offer tax incentives. Toronto did not offer it. If you take a look at number two, you see an article from the CBC on why Toronto did not make that offer. And you see two arguments presented. One is from a Stanford economics professor who says it's never worth it. He says in terms of local economic activity, there's essentially zero benefit. He does concede that you bring in a labor force that will spend their money locally. And he says, as you see the quote in, uh, in number two, it's probably better for a community to buy Amazon than a basketball team. Right? In terms of bang for your buck and what kind of return on your investment there will be, it'll do better for you than a basketball team will. But that's not really, yeah, that, that's not your standard. Um, that's one argument is they don't pay back their cost. A second argument is brought by a fellow named Richard Florida, who I don't know who he is, but he was on the board to create the bid. So presumably he's somebody with some standing in this field. Anybody know who he is? Professor of UT. Yeah, U of T professor. Thank you. The, um, I should have Googled him, and I didn't. The... Um, so his, his argument is actually twofold. Number one, he says, the company costs more just by moving in. In other words, a company moving in is not all roses. When you move in a company, often you need to invest in infrastructure to be able to handle it. Imagine a company like that moving into the Toronto area. Right? Our traffic is bad enough. Right? How in the world are you going to take care of the company's needs, the needs of all the people who are moving in, the, uh, the fact that they can't afford the real estate market and now you have to worry about housing issues. The, um, there are all sorts of costs associated with them moving in and now you're forfeiting the, uh, the property taxes. And he also made an argument which I find very Torontonian, that it's unseemly. The, uh, it's, 
says Pasnish uh, to uh, to make that kind of a pitch. He said, um, "Where was the uh, where was the quote?" Yeah, that was disgusting. There you go. Thank you. It's disgusting," said Richard Florida. They um, he resigned from it in order to try to convince the other cities not to put expensive carrots on the table. I didn't really follow that because he resigned from Toronto's bid, and I'm not really clear on how that's going to influence Nashville or uh, or any other place. Yes. So right. So I'm not going to get into the sports discussion. It's a fun discussion, but I'm not going to do it right now. The um, the there are, the arguments in favor are interesting. The arguments against, quite frankly seem to have a lot of weight behind them, and I hear it in a lot of different quarters. I've read a lot, uh, a lot about it. Number one, the argument is, you're giving away the store, but the company doesn't really care. Meaning, the property tax incentive really isn't that meaningful for the business. Often when you're talking about certainly an Amazon level business, when you rank what their expenses are, what they're paying in property taxes isn't, isn't all that significant. That's not what they're looking at. That's number one. Number two, many municipalities offer them, almost all of the offers in the case of Amazon, had it. Toronto did not, and there was one other that didn't release their bid, but they said we didn't offer it. Um, the, uh, and that's it. So if everybody's offering them, it's basically a wash. You haven't actually gained anything. I'm going to just go through the negatives, and then, uh, and then I'll take a couple of, uh, of added points. Number two, even if it does affect the company's decision, you don't necessarily get the results you want. Jobs will often not go to people in your area who need work. They'll often go to people who move with the business, right? Certainly in the U.S. that's true, Canada less so, but in the U.S. people move with their jobs. The job moves, you move also. We got very excited when I was a, a rabbi in, uh, in Pennsylvania, in Allentown, Olympus moved. Olympus, the cameras and the electronic equipment and so on, they moved in. And we thought this is great because, you know, there could be Jews with jobs and technology who are going to move in and get... The reality is that the, for the company's own sake, they try to move the people who are working for them already to come with the company. It makes a lot of sense for them to move to move people rather than either have to deal with layoffs and severance issues or, or ill will and so on. They, um, and that way they have their workforce. Um, the tax breaks, as I mentioned, often extend beyond the life of the business. You also harm other businesses in the area who are competing with them. Good, you brought them in. Now what do you do with the people who are already your tax base? Other new businesses who want to move to your area are now going to say, well, what about us? You want us to move in? Match what you offer to them. And the lack of tax revenue leads to weaker public services in the area. So you, you, you have many downsides, many negatives. Anyone have an additional negative? Not something I already said. The ethical issue. Like, why should I have to use their phones for them to like, assess Toronto on its merits? And, you know, it's worth more than its quality of life. Not that I have to give you money to entice you. You know what I mean? Like, the- well, why not? When you buy a product, it's not on your merits. <laughs> you don't walk into the store and say, I'm a really nice guy, so would you please hand that to me? You're buying. You're buying the company. That's what you're doing. Yeah, okay. But at the end of the day, there's, you know, there's, there's still, I, I think, a, a, an ethical issue that you have to I mean, weigh on. This isn't, this isn't dating. <laughs> this, is, this is finance. You know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and that's, you know, that's the Richard Florida point. Um, but I just... They're, they're large enough that they certainly could afford to... You know, I mean, it's not like some little startup business that... Right. Like, this is Amazon, it's a trillion dollar company. Right. They really don't need it. They're just trying to, you know, Understood. play one city against the other. Understood. Arnie. You know, what, what you said about every, all the cities that are offering it, <clears throat> nobody gets to hit. What is good for an individual is not always good for everybody. For example, if you're watching a movie and you're standing in your toes, and you can get to see very many things else. But unfortunately, everybody thinks it's a good idea. They all stand in their toes. Nobody's in it, but they're all uncomfortable. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And that's what happens here, although the businesses do nicely. Okay, Jerry, and then I'm going to go further. Yeah. This is the Yucca Spectre. The Yucca Spectre had a company like that in Toronto. 
yeah. is enticing to bring other companies also white banks. That the, as you said, the yeah. Silicon Valley. And then the other point is, you said something about the politicians mm-hmm. that they they do that because they want to do it. But there's also the politicians that are saying no. The same yes. No. Also, because they want to sell it. Oh yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely true. It's on both. It's yeah. They were all the left wing. Everyone's playing to their base. It's only a question of who your base is. Yeah. No, that's true. So, so you know, the right. fact remains is that that's how companies, that's how cities grow, that's how places grow. When the businesses grow, you grow. Right. Understood. It's a point of view. So, so how does this relate to financial services professionals? Well, first of all, because sometimes you get called in to consult with government about crafting this kind of a, uh, of a policy. And remembering that you have a responsibility to act in the public interest, you need to think about what exactly will the impact be. That's number one. Number two, um, what you're also talking about here is a type of competition in which you are potentially harming the other competitors. So, for example, you offer a tax incentive to one business and not to others. You offer it selectively. Or your region is going to offer this as a way to beat out other regions. So I won't gain, but on the other hand, neither will they. The, um, the, uh, that's a, a concern. Is that an ethical form of competition? And then third, we had a class last year about corporate social responsibility and what you do when the path to stakeholder profit involves harm for the community. And that can be a very real factor here where, again, you bring them in, you give them the, the, the tax break. The result is that social services suffer. Taxes on other people have to go up. Someone's got to pay for the hospitals. The, uh, you can't just say, well, well, we'll manage because in 10 years, Amazon will be giving us more money, we'll bring in more business, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have hired more people. So I have four specific questions to address. There are many questions you can put um, from, a, from a Jewish standpoint, but I have four specific ones here. And you can see them in number four. The first question we're going to address, I'm not going to read them all aloud, I'll read them as we go through them. But the first one is this. Offering tax incentives for business investment suggests that there are other ways in which these corporations support society. We like the idea of bringing them here, and they won't have to pay the property tax because what we'll get back from them in other ways is the equivalent of them having, or better than, them having paid the property tax. The employment that they're going to offer, and the name that they're going to give the community, and the, uh, the anchor for other businesses to move in, because they're a Silicon Valley anchor, and so forth. The, um, so, can we view that as an in-kind way of paying taxes, so to speak, and say that therefore we should cancel out this kind of, uh, of requirement. Is it ethical to say there's such a thing as an in-kind contribution for their, uh, for their taxes? That's our opening question from an ethical standpoint, not from a financial standpoint, but from an ethical standpoint. What do you think? Could be. Could be. <laughs> Are we implying that they support corporate taxes anyway? I mean, everyone's paying personal taxes regardless. Right. So why is corporate taxes in the domain of ethics anyway? So that goes back to the corporate social responsibility lecture where we talked about the question of whether corporations have an ethical responsibility. And from a Jewish perspective, it seems they do insofar as they're made up of individuals. And the debate about whether we view a corporation as an abstract entity or as a set of individuals doesn't matter in the end because it's individuals who are making the decisions. So, so there is, from a halakhic standpoint, there's a responsibility on them to, to act ethically. Granted, they have to be concerned for their stakeholders as well. Moses said, what is the job of the director? He's employed for one particular right. That is to look after the interests of the job. We're going to come back to that. We're not there yet. We'll get to that. So take a look at source number five. Professor Neil Brooks, in an article, The Logic Policies, Policy and Politics of Tax Law, says, at the most basic level, we have taxes because we have governments. Collecting taxes is simply one of the ways the government has to achieve its broad social and economic objectives. The efficient allocation of resources, and thus the maximization of social welfare, is the normative government objective that preoccupies economists. So, in other words, the goal of taxation 
is fundamentally the engineering of society's financial welfare. It is, yes, a redistribution of income. Call it whatever you like. That's what it is. And for the sake of funding social services and as a way to take care of society. Halakha recognizes that. Jewish law positions the government as an engineer of the economy. It views tax payment as a basic requirement of residency, and it empowers the government to levy taxes as it sees fit. I brought you an example in source number six. There's a Mishnah, Mishnah, the founding text of the Talmud writes, we compel him to participate, him as a resident, someone who moves into a city. We compel him to participate in building a guardhouse and door for the yard, the local area where he lives. We force him to participate in building a wall, that's not a political statement, doors and a bolt on behalf of the city as well. How long must one be in the city to be considered a resident? Twelve months. But once he buys a resident, he's a resident immediately. So you have a responsibility to pay into municipal needs, in this case, communal defense. And then the Gemara commenting on it in source number six, Rabbi Asi quoted Rabbi Ochanan to say, Everyone, even minor orphans, gives to the city's defenses, but not rabbis. They don't require protection. Ha! The um, Rav Papa said, for a wall, patrols and armor guards, even minor orphans pay, not rabbis. They do not require protection. The general rule, whoever benefits, pays, even minor orphans. The reason they keep on stressing the, uh, the orphans is because, as minors, they're exempt from responsibility for all sorts of things. We're going to come back to why they are paying in... Uh, in this particular case. Sorry? Why they stress the rabbis? So they stress the rabbis because they are rabbis. <laughs> they, um, no, they, they, they stress the... That's why it's stressed. That's not the reason for the law. The reason for the law is a conception which I understand not everyone's going to agree, but it's a conception that says that the Torah study that they're doing actually will protect them, and if everybody followed suit, you wouldn't need to worry about walls and defenses and, uh, and whatnot. I, I get the idea, yes. The Talmud says you don't rely on miracles, they um, uh, understood, and they're not. They're living in a city in which people are building the walls. But they, no, they, um, but the, the idea here is that he's not using the defenses, and therefore he's not responsible. I will hasten to note that many have written that this doesn't mean you are exempt from participating in communal defense. The uh, issues like military service in Israel and, uh, and, and the like still require participation by everybody. But not, even if you don't need it personally, everybody else needs it, and there's an element of participating within society and worrying about the needs of others. So the, the fact that you don't have to pay into this you know, uh, bolt and whatever doesn't exempt you from all responsibility for the community. But it's a distraction from the main point. The main point is the statement that the, there is a responsibility to pay for municipal needs. And this is brought by the Ramah in source number 7, one of the authors of the Shulchan Aruch, of the Code of Jewish Law. The residents of a city are viewed as partners in any municipal need. That's the way we look at it. And the Code of Jewish Law codifies this not only for physical needs, but for spiritual needs. It talks about communities in which they didn't have a minion available, but they wanted to make sure they have a minion for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And the rule is the entire community is responsible to pay into a fund in order to bring people so that there will be a minion for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. They, uh, they talk about a community that wants a chazan. And you know, I realize the trend in our day is the opposite direction. They'll pay not to. But they, uh, but they wanted to have a chazan. So again, everybody within the community is responsible to pay into a fund in order to, uh, in order to bring a, a chazan. And you don't find in-kind exemptions. Just the opposite. We find extra obligations. So I brought you as an example, source number eight. We mentioned these orphans who are technically exempt. In source number 8, Rabbi Yosef Karo, principal author of the Shulchan Aruch, of the Code of Jewish Law, says that an apotropos, a legal guardian for these minor orphans, is able to contribute on their behalf to a tzedakah fund. The, uh, why? To give them status. Meaning, when you look around in the community and you see somebody is contributing towards the benefit of the community, that person is respected. If you see someone who isn't engaging in support of the community, you say, well, they're not a player. They're not out there for everybody else. So that's the way that halakhically we look at 
um, tax payment. It's part of your basic responsibility as a resident of an area, and you can't say, well, I'm contributing in other ways. The exemption of the Torah scholar is not, he's contributing by learning Torah, therefore he's exempt from the taxes. That's not the Talmud's argument. The argument is that he's not using it, and therefore he doesn't need to pay into it, which again, I've noted, is more controversial than, than we're gonna than we're gonna be able to address within this topic. It's not really the main point here. But the but from an ethical perspective, we don't make the the suggestion that a business which helps everybody in one way is therefore exempt from helping in another way. They don't have an entitlement to say we shouldn't have to pay taxes because we are providing jobs. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way from a Jewish ethics perspective. That's number one. Steve, you look uh, perplexed or... No, no, just thoughtful. Okay, the, um, that's number one. Number two, the issue of favoring a particular sector. If you go back to the bullet points in number four, the second one. Tax incentives are, are applied unevenly. Favoring new businesses or businesses of a particular size over others. Does government have the right to legislatively favor one sector of the population? Yes. I have a question on the point you made 60 seconds ago. In the example you gave where the community essentially is taxed in order to bring in people from another community to ensure that there's a minion for the benefit of the whole, is that not the same as the city of Toronto uh, taxpayers paying to bring Amazon to ensure that we have whatever it is that we need in the community. Doesn't right. that argue in favor of, from a halakha point of view, rather than against? So it argues in favor of financial incentives, but not tax incentives. Meaning, it would be legitimate for the community to say, we want to encourage new business, we want to create some kind of financial package that, let's say, um, one of the things that I saw, one of the uh, tax incentives, I saw it wasn't really a tax incentive, it's a separate incentive was a, I think it was the city of Boston, when they made their proposal to Amazon, included a lump sum of money that they were willing to invest in keeping housing prices manageable for people who came in to take, uh, to take jobs with, uh, with Amazon. So that wasn't the tax break. It was, we're going to create a fund which is going to go towards helping encourage them to come here, and if they want to tax the community and say, everybody pays into this, that's legitimate. What they can't do, though, is say, we are now going to have a city in which some people pay taxes and some people don't pay taxes because they're helping the city in some other way. It's specifically on the taxation point. So progressive taxes was a topic we discussed a couple of years ago. I'm not going back to that. We talked about regressive taxation versus progressive taxation. Fascinating, fun topic. If you want, I can send you the link for the audio. But, uh, but, but, the, but I'm, I'm definitely not going back to that one. That was a painful topic. No, that was, that was a good topic. The, um, but the issue here is this. You favor one sector. You say, I'm going to give to tech companies because I want to become the new Silicon Valley. Or you say, I want businesses that will bring in a minimum of 10, 20, 100 new jobs. So what about everybody else? Right? What happens to, uh, what happens to everybody else in this, uh, you know, in, in this calculation? Is it fair to have legislation that will favor a particular sector? So if you take a look at source number nine, and this is always your starting point in discussions about taxation. It is the passage in the Talmud that recognizes officially the ability of a non-Jewish government to tax. Uh, and it says, Mishnah says, one may not make change using money from the tax collector's box. I added the words in brackets, it is viewed as stolen material. Meaning the first sen sentence, the Mishnah, sounds like we don't recognize taxation. If there is a tax collector who has funds, you can't make change from that money, it's considered stolen. So the Gemara, commenting on the Mishnah, says, what are you talking about? There's a sage by the name of Shmuel who said the law of the kingdom is the law. Dina de Machusa, Dina. And therefore, the government has every right to levy taxes. So Rabbi Hanina Bar Kahana explained that it depends on the kind of tax collector. The Mishnah that calls it theft is talking about a tax collector who doesn't have a fixed amount. Or, alternatively, we go on to suggest it's a self-appointed tax collector. <laughs> Some guy sets up shop on the road and he says, I am going to, uh, to, take, to, to take money from people as they, um, 
you know, as they travel through, that's not tax collection, right? That's called highway robbery, literally. The um, the the idea of um, that's right. I'll get it after. the um, The idea of of tax uh, of tax collection is that the government is going to collect taxes from the population. The government is going to to go across the population and say everyone has to kick in a certain amount of money. As we've said. You have a government, you're going to need taxes to support what the government wants to do. A variety of arguments are presented in halacha to explain why the government has this power. The most famous argument is the argument, well, the football argument, essentially. Right? The one who comes to, to play football with all the other kids in school, but he actually has the ball, is the one who makes the rules about how you're going to play. So the government owns the land, and this goes back to monarchies, which owned the land for all intents and purposes, so they make the rules. You want to live here? They say you have to pay a certain amount of money, and that's one argument. It's their land. You don't like it? Leave. The uh, second argument, opposite end of the end of the spectrum, is that it's a social contract. It's not about the, uh, them owning it. It's about society. Everybody within society decides we support a policy in which tax dollars are collected and they are spent and these people are the ones who are going to be the arbiters of how much and, uh, and, and how to spend it. It's the community that creates it. A third argument is that one of the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach, the Noachide laws, the laws that apply to all human beings, is the requirement of setting up laws to govern society. That's one of the mitzvahs. That's one of their commandments. You can't very well say that society is responsible to elect leadership, to choose leadership, whether elected or otherwise, who are going to make laws and then not respect those laws. How could, you, how could you say that they're obligated to create the laws and that you're not going to observe them? So clearly then, if they have to create laws, you have to observe it. There are various arguments that are presented to explain it, but the bottom line is that Jewish law recognizes the ability of the government to make laws and especially to tax Right? This is why I get so annoyed every time I hear somebody you know, talk about somebody Jewish who says, no, I don't have to pay taxes. I'm sorry, yes you do. They, um, it's actually fairly straightforward in halacha. So the question becomes, though, what about if the tax is applied unevenly? What about where they're taxing some people, but they're not taxing everybody, right? That goes back to source number nine. A tax collector who doesn't have a fixed amount. He says, yeah, you know what, I want, I'm not talking about progressive taxation where it's, you know, 10% for this bracket and 50% for that bracket. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where there is no system. I don't like the Jews, so the Jews are going to have to pay 70%. I do like the Catholics, so the Catholics are going to pay 10%. Right? Things that occurred in Europe for centuries and centuries and centuries. That, that type of, uh, of issue. They, um, so, so will we respect that kind of system? So take a look at source number 10, where Rabbeinu Asher, the Rosh, said no. And he quotes the view of Rabbeinu Tam, one of the authors of Tosfot on the Talmud going back to the 12th century Rabbeinu Tam. He explains, we only honor government law when the king applies his decrees equally for all members of his reign. Where he changes it for one nationality, that's not law. The ability of government to legislate, as far as Jewish law is concerned is limited to where they are going to apply the legislation to everybody equally. Well, in that case, you shouldn't be able to offer a tax incentive that favors some over others. But not so fast. Excuse me. Yeah. You can just then argue in Ontario, because you look at the Jewish school system, which is something I'm digressing a bit, because Catholics are getting special treatment like what they are So I can say, well, that's really why we should have to pay taxes. So it won't help you in terms of it won't help you in terms of property taxes. It won't help you in terms of property taxes. There's a difference between saying what is said here, which is a particular law that discriminates is illegal, and saying that discrimination in one area by a government disqualifies all of their actions. We're saying the former, not the latter. 
the, um, a particular law, and I mean, you see this in constitutional law. This isn't uh, a novelty of Judaism. It's possible for a legislature to issue a law and for it to be challenged and decreed illegitimate because it violates certain rights. The, um, and that is what effectively is the argument that's being brought here. Is that the, law is, the law is illegitimate, not that the government is illegitimate. So I'm going to go further with it. I see the hand, Jerry, but uh, you know what? It's going it's to have to hold. I'm sorry. The, um, the, the challenge to this, though, is that it depends on why they are, they are favoring one group over another group. It depends on why they're doing it. So if you take a look at source number 11, Rabbi Yosef Kolon Traboto, also known as the Maharik, he says the, um, the, where a law is promulgated the, um, in which the... Well, I'm going to skip the my because I realized I should have brought you the background on it, and I didn't, so it's, it's not as clear-cut. But look at, at, the, at number 12. That's a better example. And the Hebrews is about on one side, the English at the top of the next side. Rabbi Yosef Elio Henkin. He says he's dealing with more modern issues like rent control. And his argument is it depends on why they are discriminating. He says, if the reason for it is to distinguish between one nation and another, based on ethnicity, based on religion, something like that, that's illegitimate. The, um, it's done out of cruelty. But if there's a policy issue for the benefit of the land, then he says you are absolutely allowed to discriminate. And the basic principle is that the distinction has to be made based on the needs of the land and what is considered normal for governments to do. So Rabbi Yisrael Easterlein in source number 13, the Truma Sadeshen, says, we see that all rulers regularly do this, continually making demands and issuing orders. We establish our dwelling in their places. We accept their yokes and burdens upon ourselves knowing this. And so all of this is honored as government law. It's it's known. It's a given. Everybody knows that governments are going to... um, benefit some uh, in certain ways in terms of their legislation because they believe it's for the sake of society and it's an accepted thing to do. So what we're saying here is that even though the government is, um, is expected to apply the same rule for everybody, Nonetheless, it does have the power to apply taxes unevenly so long as it's not based on cruelty. I want to harm this group. I want to take advantage of this group. But it's for the benefit of society, and it's something which, generally speaking, society considers normal. That's the general approach. We don't like it, but we recognize that it's a necessity in running an economy. Jerry, you were going to say. A lot of tax laws made for social reasons. Yep. That's the whole point. You can't say it's going to be. Right. Right. No, that's the problem. You, you can't possibly take care of the needs of society by applying a law to, every, to all sectors in the same way. It's just not going to work. The third question, going back again to the bullet points, the top of the second side. A region which offers tax incentives undercuts neighboring regions at its own immediate expense. Okay. Is this a fair form of competition? In other words, one of the points that they make, one of the points that, uh, that a lot of the research on tax incentive makes is that companies don't make the big picture decision of where to locate based on a tax incentive. Right? If I'm, if I'm Amazon, or not Amazon, even lower level, smaller companies, my main concerns are things like shipping routes. Right? Or are the universities to produce the uh, young people who can come out and work for me, who will specialize in my area. I'm worried about things like that. The tax environment isn't the high-level factor. Once I've decided that a certain region is good for me, then I'll decide on municipality, and there maybe, depending on the level of incentive, then maybe I'll look at tax incentives, I'll look at the tax environment, and say this place is better for business than that place is. Right? That's where you make your decision. So here's the question. Toronto says, we want to attract a business and we are going to give up on all the property taxes. Ah, you're losing out? Yeah, but if we don't, we're going to lose them to Mississauga. Or if we don't, we're going to lose them to name some other you know, area in the region. doesn't matter. The, um, but the point is, we are willing to undercut ourselves because it will be better for us to... to, to um, 
be able to get them. They, uh, we want to, to have them. And we can undercut the competition because Mississauga can't afford to give up on the property taxes. I gave a class on this uh, several years ago. If you remember the, the OPEC um, the the oh, the I'm trying to remember what the name for it was. There was a name for it at the time, but I don't remember it anymore. OPEC had a strategy several years back. This goes back about um, I guess about five or six years when the price of oil tanked, right? And it was OPEC driven. Sorry, pump and dump. The uh, thank you. The um, OPEC developed a strategy of flooding the market with supply in order to drive prices down because the shale producers had to invest heavily in order to be able to get oil going. And once they had that oil, they could undercut OPEC. So they said, what we're going to do is they won't be able to finance that initial investment because the price of oil is going to be too low. And that way we'll drive them out of business. And it was great for you know people like me who aren't in oil because we had inexpensive gas. The... Um, but the that that approach of killer competition in which you hurt yourself but your principal goal is to drive out the competition is that acceptable as a strategy within halal generally speaking jewish law is pro competition generally speaking we're good with competition if you take a look at source number 14 classic source on the issue from the talmud mishnah the court text says, Rabbi Yehuda said, a store owner may not distribute parched grain and nuts to children, for this would accustom them to come to him. In other words, you're not selling candy. Your business is hardware. However, you know that if you give out candy, the kids love to come to your store, the parents are going to walk into the store, and they're going to see a hammer and realize, I need a hammer. So you, you uh, create a way to get them into your, into your business. Rabbi Yehuda said, that's not fair. But the sages permit... They said, no, that's okay. Rabbi Yehuda also said he should not reduce the rate. Meaning, if you go back to Roman times, there were fixed prices. There was, yeah, this is what the price is for various goods. So you're not allowed to undercut everybody else. And the stages said, no, go for it. Zakur Ladov, he's remembered for the good. We like people who do that. Why? Gemara commenting on the Mishnah says, what's the logic of the sages? Because in the end, what will happen is if people do undercut the rate, then everybody else will also drop their prices. So from this, it sounds like it's good to compete. You are able to do so. And in fact, if you look at source number 15, the uh, Rabbi Moshe Isserlis talks about outsiders moving into an area and creating competition. And he says, some say the ability of local people to protest against people from elsewhere who move in and compete is only where that protection would not harm consumers. The outsiders sell as the locals sell, and their merchandise is no better. So if other people come in from the outside and move in and compete with me, I can say that that wasn't right. If it doesn't affect everybody anyway, because they're all selling at the same price. But where the outsiders charge less, or their merchandise is better, so that consumers benefit... Local, local merchants can't protest. You can't be upset. Hey, outsiders are competing with me if they're doing a better job. Why? Because I care about the good of society. So generally speaking, halacha is pro-competition. However, we have precedent when it comes to lowering prices to say that you're not allowed to lower prices if the way you're doing it is not to make a profit for yourself but rather to eliminate the competition. So you know, they, um, this came up a lot in liquor sales. Remember that in the Middle Ages, Jews were not able in Christian Europe, as well as much of Muslim Europe for that matter, in North Africa, um, to own land. They were not allowed to enter various guilds. And so what they ended up having to do was either to traffic in capital, money lending, or traffic in goods, that so you were peddlers. They, uh, one of the things that Jews did was they would get the local liquor license. The uh, arenda, as it was called. And they would be able to sell liquor locally. That's where you have all those big, big sale of chametz responsa that come up because Jews had an awful lot of liquid chametz that they had to, uh, to somehow manage before Pesach. So the, the question comes up, you own the liquor license in one municipality, the fellow in the next town over owns a liquor license in his municipality, and he drops his prices. And now he's going to get everybody from your area going to him. Is it fair? And what they said was, let's say the price point that he needs to hit 
in order to, for him to make money, he has to charge, I'm making up numbers obviously, he has to charge $100 per unit in order to make money. He's allowed to lower his price to 101 <laughs> That he can do. So he just reduces his margin. But it's a legitimate tactic. He's getting more business, and he's surviving, making a profit. However, if he drops his price to 99 then what he's just trying to do is get rid of the vendor next door, right? So that he'll have the market to himself, at which point he's going to raise the price again, because now he has a, he has a monopoly. And that was considered illegitimate. That's something that one is not allowed to do. If you take a look at source number 16, Rabbi Shlomo Yehuda Tabak, where he reduces in order to harm the other, thinking neither I nor you will gain... Right? I'm not going to gain, but neither will you, and ultimately you'll give in before I do, then even where he does this in order to, to induce the other to pay him, it's not to drive him out of business. He just says, I want protection money from the guy next door. They, uh, we compel him not to act as Sodom. And what that means is a concept we've talked about before, kofin al-midat Sodom, that you're not allowed to act in such a way that harms others and doesn't help you. You're not even gaining anything. You're just harming somebody else. That is inappropriate, and so that's the that's the basic um, that's the basic principle that we employ, which is why in source number seventeen in the Shulchan Aruch in the Code of Jewish Law, we are told one may sell for less than the going rate, so that people will buy from him, so that people will buy from him in order to gain consumers. Then no one else can protest. However, if it's not about gaining consumers, if it just let's drive the other guy out of, out of business, then it doesn't uh, then it doesn't work. So you have to be really careful. The justification has to be that I am building something for myself, not that I'm knocking others out of the running. So that they aren't able to uh, to compete anymore. I realize that to a certain extent, this is a matter of perspective. Everyone's going to look at this and say, well, I'm doing this to gain, not in order to hurt the other guy. But you have to ask, in this move, am I actually going to profit, or is my only benefit that down the road I won't have competition from the guy next door? If that's the goal, if that's the factor, then, uh, then it's an inappropriate initiative. Are we, are we clear on that? Okay. Other thoughts on that before we go to the last one? Yes? <coughs> If his initiative is to um, just gain the customers, and he does that, um, this is his mind um, giving justification to a Kurdish oracle? Yes. That's how we're dealing yes. with it. Yes. No basin is going to be able to do anything if that's really what he's saying he's right. doing. And yes. what he really wants, more customers. Yeah. But then, two months down the road, someone opens competition right nearby, and he'll go down to $98. Yeah. So, uh, then we're into a new... It's a new story now. It's a, it's a new scenario. Yeah. And each one has to be looked at independently. Right. Yeah. Right. So, really, he's just um, answering his... his um, In that, in that discussion. Number one is the fact that certain businesses may be able to cut prices more because of economies of scale or, or other factors that are unique to them. They're not really operating on a level playing field. The other is that it's actually in this week's Parsha, um, the law of Ona prohibits undercutting everybody by a certain percentage. There's a, there's a, there is a limit in terms of, of, well, that's not really on the vendor, though. That's the buyer. The buyer is not allowed to underpay by a certain amount below the local rate. But it's, it's a separate issue, and I didn't want to get into it. I just want to note that it exists. There is a, a, a technique that's called a lost leader. Yes. We're going to yeah. put this price on so people 
And certain, right, and in certain cases that'll be okay, in certain cases it won't. I'm going to take one more. I'm going to comment, if I personally uh, now find I need to earn a livelihood, and I decide I'm going to try uh, my, earning my livelihood by becoming a dealer in eggs. And the community is well supplied with egg dealers. Um, the strategy to break into an existing market is offer something, if possible, uh, that will distinguish me from all the other egg producers. So I have to come up with something. I'm going to offer better service, or as I suggested, uh, a loss leader for a particular period or whatever. But breaking into an established uh, market is uh, quite a challenge. Yes. You know, agreed. And breaking into the market actually isn't necessarily a justification. Meaning, one of the sources that I brought here, um, number uh, number 15, speaks to the issue of whether you're allowed to move into a new area and take business away from existing businesses. This is an issue that's... We, right, we've talked about it over the years. Some is not stopping you from doing something. It's saying, in this limited place, you can't do it. Anywhere else you can. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's true. But also, Hasagas Gabul is controversial. It's not a straightforward prohibition at all. The idea that I can't overstep the bounds of somebody else's business. We've discussed it off and on over the years. I think when I send up my follow-up email, I'm going to include links to some of the classes that we've had here that relate to this. The, um, because the, there are issues that really are larger than we're going to be able to address here. The last area that I wanted to talk about is the issue of accepting an incentive where you would have moved there anyway. Because that's one of the major points that's raised is you're often giving these incentives to companies that were going to go there anyway. So here's the question. The board of directors of the company says, we were going to go there anyway, but they're offering us these incentives, so let's say yes. Right? Is there anything ethically wrong with accepting the offer that they're, that they're making? The truth of the matter is, we have precedent for declining an offer where you would have been willing to accept without it. Take a look at number, four, number 18, which is one example of this. There are a few that are found in, in Talmud and, and, and other places. The, um, it's talking about these stones on the Hoshen. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, had a breastplate that had gems on it, representing each of the tribes of Israel. So the stone for the tribe of Benjamin was the Yashfet stone. So at one point it was lost, and the sages said, where are we going to get a gem like that? I don't know how it was lost. I, I, I don't know who was supposed to be watching it, but it, it's, it's gone. So they were told, Dama Ben Netina. This fellow happens not to be Jewish, parenthetically. And the sages went to him and told him they'll pay him a hundred dinar for the gem. He says, okay. He goes to get it. He finds his father is sleeping. Some say his father had the key for the safe in his hand. Others say that his father's leg was resting on the safe. But he doesn't want to wake him up. And he comes back and he says, I can't, I can't give it to you. Sorry, I can't, I can't do it. The, um, obviously, his father would have been very happy to make a profit, so the commentator suggests maybe there was some element of dementia or something that the, uh, the father would have been angry had he been woken up despite the lost profit. So the sage has said, maybe you want more money, we'll give you 200, we'll give you 1,000. When his father wakes up, Dhamma went and he brings the gem. They wanted to give him what they promised at the end. They said, okay, here's 1,000. He said, I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to sell my father's honor to you for coins. I don't want to make money from honoring my father. I'm not willing to, uh, I'm not willing to, to accept it. And God pays him back because his cow gives birth to a para aduma, a red heifer, which is very important in ritual, and the Jews pay him its weight in gold. They, um, that's one story. There's a similar story involving Rasafra, one of the sages, who is uh, in prayer, and somebody comes to him with a business deal and offers him money, and he puts up his hand saying, you know, just wait. And the fellow interprets it as, go away. And so he raises again. He says, I'll give you this, I'll give you this, I'll give you this. And when he finishes praying, he says, I'll take the price you mentioned in the first place. I was willing to accept that. So does that mean here that a company would be required to decline the tax incentives because they were going to show up anyway? Is this a locking, or is this what he did, a high ethical standard that's right. beyond... What you really need to do, right. if you can do it, you wouldn't do it, it would be considered. Right. Good. Course, but it's not, you know, you wouldn't be doing anything wrong if you took the higher price, 
Good question. Right. Just that it's not the highest level of Right. So the answer in my mind is that it's it can be a halachic issue only if there's deception involved. Meaning we have a prohibition against Gedevas Das. You are not allowed to delude people. We had a class last year, I think, on ethical negotiation in which we talked about bargaining with somebody by presenting a bluff. Right? Where the two people, right? It's the Middle East now, okay? So, you know, he wants what you have, right? And you say, I'm not selling it for less than five. You know you're going to agree on three. You know that you're going you're to take three. I'm never going to... But everybody knows that that's the game. And we said that's legitimate, because everybody knows that that's the way it's done. You're just, you're just presenting your position. On the other hand, if what you do is deceptive, you're actually saying something that isn't true, and that's the message the other person is receiving. You're saying, we're not moving here. We're not moving, even though you've already decided you're going. Like, you have your surveyors out there already looking at land. They, um, and you just say something that isn't true in order to get a better deal from them. Then it goes beyond ethics to an area of halacha, of gnevas das. You can't deceive other people. In the event that there's no deception involved, then it's you know the ethical question, which is what you see in the Dama Ben Natina story and the in the uh, in the Rav Safra story. I think if you haven't done anything to to mislead them into raising their bid, they chose to do it on their own. You're able to uh, you're able to accept it. The um, even though it wasn't necessary, that was that was their decision. So to sum up. To sum up the conclusion, any sentence of on politicians, I'm just going to ignore. The, um, the, the, the conclusions of what we've said, um, I'm not going to go back over the financial conclusions, but the, the halachic and ethical conclusions within Judaism are, number one, we don't have a history of accepting in-kind exemptions from taxation. Taxation is a civic duty, which I believe does extend to the, uh, to the corporation as well. Government is able to favor a particular sector, assuming that, it's not done out of cruelty, but this is the way to benefit society and its normal conduct. We said that you're not allowed to compete with other regions at your own expense, where you're lowballing this in order to be able to drive them out of the competition. That's inappropriate, but where it can be constructed as a legitimate business move for your own benefit, then it's okay, and the company is able to accept the incentive if they were to move there anyway, so long as they don't act in a deceitful way in order to draw that concession from the uh, from the municipality. Um, please, if you didn't sign in, and definitely if you want Want to either receive the follow-up emails or um, or a credit letter saying you were here? Um, please, please make sure that you do sign in. I see sheets over here. I think all three of the sheets are on the table right here in front. Next week, as your Deanna speaks on business lunches in uh, in the view of Halacha and the CRA. So we will have a business lunch right here. Right here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Desaifmans. Um, this is a good time for Bekata Mazon for Mizuman for anyone who. Uh,